the nursery this morning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John, if you would. 1 John, and if you would, go to chapter 3 with me because I'd like to do something here starting out this morning. Of course, I have been on the series of Come Fellowship. God wants us to come fellowship. It's important for us to know and to understand as believers that we have a place in Christ where we have a family, we have a fellowship that the world doesn't understand. Why do you go to church? I mean, how inconvenient is that on a day that you could just relax? Why would you go to church? Well, those that are lost have no clue. They don't understand the fellowship. They don't understand what that's all about. What a great blessing it is that we have a fellowship that's in Christ and Him alone. Well, I would like for you to look at chapter 3 and verse number 1, and you're going to sing with me. There's a song, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. There's those of you that might be familiar with this, or maybe some that's not. And uh, so I'd like for you to sing this with me if you would. Are you ready? Here we go. Let's do it. It goes, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Again, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. All right, good. Now, there's a round that goes with that. So let's just do it for the fun of it. We practiced this on Wednesday night. And uh, I really need someone to do the second round that might melt me. You were there Wednesday night. Come on up here. All right. Here's what we're going to do. I'll let, I'll let you start because you know the song, don't you? Okay. I'll let you start it. So we'll have you to do that with this group over there. All right. And then this group over here, you just follow me, all right? Now, you'll round through it one time until you come to what we just did. You'll do it a time and a half, all right? And then we'll close out last. Okay. Behold what man of the love the Father has given unto us. Behold what man of the love the Father has given unto us. Behold what we should be called the sons of God. Father has given unto us. Behold what manner the love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner the love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. I repeated it twice. I can't can't do it. (laughs) I can't do the round. I did my job. You did your job. (laughs) All right. But I know that they can do it because they were doing it and you guys were lost. You're following a lost person on that song. So I'm saved, but I was lost on that one. So let's do it. Why don't you come up here? Why don't one of you come up here and and you're going to help lead. We're going to try that one more time. And I can do the normal thing or I can actually sing. Can you do it too? Okay, good. That works. We'll have... We, let's have two of you because I can do the normal spot. We're going to do the same thing again. They're going to do the round. Do the second part, okay? Do what? No, it's, I just can't do that part. All right, let's do it again. Ready? Here we go. Behold what manner of love a father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love a father has given unto us. That we should become the sons of God. That we should become the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. We didn't.
didn't do enough of it, I guess. Switch up, switch up, let's do it. I'm not going to try that second part. I can't do it. All right, you guys do it with me. Behold what manner of love. We're going to do the first part. They're going to do the second part. Ready? Here we go. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Keep going. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. All right, give yourself a hand. Good job. All right. Well, that got better as we went along. My goodness. You ever have a brilliant idea and about partway through it, you go, why did I ever do this? <laughs> I should have just stepped out of the way from the start. All right. Well, you know what? We've been talking about the love of God. And I want us to understand, in our fellowship together, there is one element that holds us together. It's God's love. It's His love. It's not about ourselves, but we are to behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. And for us to grab hold of that love and to understand that love. And I tell you that, unfortunately, this subject takes a beating in Christian circles a lot of times. That, you know, all, you know, there's a, a lot of preaching. And all, you know, it's all about love. It's all about love. And there's churches that are really like, you know, that's all they emphasize a lot. Let me tell you something. If it weren't for the love of God, every one of us would be in trouble. I have come to find out even more as I study this out. It seems like everything I read in Scripture points back to the love of God. Everything. If you don't believe me, you just go to the end of the book, right? You want to know how a book ends? Go to the end of the book, the book of Revelation, and find out what it is that caused the church of Ephesus to not be the church that God wanted it to be because it had lost something. It's amazing how that, that element is lost in the midst of being so close to the one who loves. And yet the scripture says in chapter 3, of, in verse number 3, it says, And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. There's a hope that we have. It's, it's a love that comes from God. It's a hope that we don't have in ourselves. And this hope isn't a, is a, a guess so or a maybe. This hope is an assurance. This assurance that we have. This hope that we have. And those who have this hope purifies himself even as Christ Jesus is pure. I guess it was maybe Sunday night, I gave you a little bit of Kellogg theology. And I had stated it, Kellogg theology was this, that the opposite of love is bitterness. People think that the opposite of love is hate, but that's not true. Because how can he who is love also hate? If hate and love's the opposite, they can't be in the same spot, but God hates sin, doesn't he? But he loves. He is love. He is the essence of love. So hate's not the opposite of love. Hate's like a gun. It all depends on whose hand it's in and how it's used to whether it's right or wrong. There are certain things we ought to hate. But that hate should be motivated by love. Man, that'll twist the human mind, right? It's hard to kind of put those two things together. But yet the Bible says 
to husbands, love your wife and be not bitter against them. And, and I've watched throughout Scripture where the Bible talks about bitterness and how that bitterness is just the opposite reflection of, of love. But yet, you know, God was really dealing with me this week. I was getting ready this week, and I'm always pondering and, and thinking and studying, and I was just studying on that whole thought of love. And, you know, I've come to change my Kellogg theology. That is this. I don't believe, I do believe that the opposite of love is bitterness, but the opposite of love is a lot of different things. But it really roots back to one thing. The opposite of love is sin. Now, bitterness is sin, right? There's a lot of other elements that, but the opposite of love is sin. I believe that when we have love, sin is driven out. I believe where we have sin, love doesn't exist. Understand this, that God says, and we're going to talk about these verses here coming up, but he that knoweth God knoweth what? Knoweth love, for God is love. So there's only one way to drive sin out, and that's through God, right? When I know God, when I know the essence of His love, it's because of His love that cleanses me of my sin. So the application of Christ's love to my life eliminates sin. Does that make sense? So the opposite of love is, is sin. When I'm not, when I am not loving, I'm sinning. And when I'm sinning, I'm not, I'm not loving. I just want, I want to put that in your mind. I want you to think about that for a few minutes. Because the scripture says in verse 3 of chapter 3, And every man that hath this hope, the hope of the love of the manner, the manner of love that God has bestowed upon us. That we are the sons of God. To him, he purifies himself even as Christ is pure. And yet, I hear people say, oh, you know what, but he's God. He's, Jesus is God, and so I can't be like him. You know, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there's a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but he was God. Can I just say this, if I may? If you're a believer, if you're, and I don't mean just that you believe, like the devil believes and trembles. I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're one of his disciples, can I just let you in on a tidbit? You are a son of God. Guess what Jesus was, or is? The son of God. Of God. So let this mind be in you, which was also quit pushing off and shucking off responsibility of living in Christ and excusing ourselves. We can't do that. God doesn't want to us want us to excuse our life of sin. Well, you know, I'm not God. I can't do that. I beg to differ with you. I beg to differ with anyone who would say that a person can be saved and not love. Because Christ is the essence of love. So we see in verse number 5 of chapter 3, look there with me if you would, and it says, and you know that he was manifested to do what? To take away our sins. And in him is no sin. In him is no sin. So if I don't want to be in sin then where do I need to be? In Him. If I don't want to be in sin, be in Him. And not sin. In Him. Not sin. Because in Him is no sin. When I abide in Him, I'm not going to be in sin. See how that works? Oh, I, you know, I, I keep trying. I keep trying. I mean, man, living this Christian life's tough. I just keep trying. I... Why don't you just surrender to Him? We try in our own efforts to please God, but our righteousness is just self-righteousness. 
The Bible says it's but filthy rags before God. We can do it. But we can be in him. So the scripture goes on to say in verse number 6 of chapter 3, Whosoever abides in him, what does he do? He sins not. Whoso sins has not seen him, neither known him. Now, I just want you to, to understand this. This doesn't mean because you may have a sin in your life that there may be those occasions of sin. You're, you're going to sin. Thus, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what this passage is talking about is when sin is our character. When sin is who we are. By the way, what's the middle letter in sin? So thinking about when we're motivated by I, when our life is about doing what I want to do, then who do you think sitting on the throne of your life? I, right? But who should be on the throne of our life? Christ. When we have ourself on the throne, everything we do is about ourself. Therefore, we make decisions based on ourself. We ought to abide in Christ. He ought to be on the throne of our life. So I want you to look at verse number 8 as well. What an awesome verse of chapter 3. It says, he that commits sin is of the devil. In other words, he that... The character of who they are, their, their being, their purpose is about themselves. And, and they're living, they're not living love, but they're living sin. He's of the devil. For the devil's sin, from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. The way he destroys the work of the devil is by calling all men unto himself. Because when you're drawn to him, there is no sin. Sin's found when you're away from Jesus. Sin's found in our life when we get away from Jesus. It's when we quit having him on the throne of our life. It's when we begin to depend on ourselves. Then sin begins to dominate our life once again. So how important it is that we understand this element of our Christian walks. That God wants us to abide in Him. And when we abide in Him, He abides in us, the Scripture tells us. He dwells inside of us. Matter of fact, if you would, look at verse number 24. And this is one of the last verses that I had shared with you last. Matter of fact, we'll look at verse 23 and 24. These are the last two verses I shared with you last week in the message. And this, and this is His commandment. That we should believe on the name of the Son or the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us what? Commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby know, hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. Do you, do you understand that when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior... That the Holy Spirit came and now resides inside of you? I don't know if that really comes to reality of what that means for you. But I want you to see this. When the Holy Spirit comes and resides and lives inside of you, He enables you to do that which you do not have the capability of doing in and of yourself. So that's where somebody says, yeah, but he was God. Yeah, but God lives in you. That's right, he's God. And now he lives in you. And you say you can't do it? You're right, you can't do it. But he who lives in you can. But the question is, who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne of your, of your life? 
So we look at chapter 4, and this is the main text today. Come fellowship. In chapter 4, I want to just share with you today, just real brief here, truth and error. Truth and error. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 1 and following. We're going to look at verse 1 to verse 6. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, whereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it, is, that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. Verse number six, we are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I just want to take and break this apart for you for just a moment. The scripture tells us to try the spirits. Now, what this is talking about, and we are to try the spirits, and what this is talking about is that in our life as a Christian, as a believer, that there, are, there is the spirit of man that proclaims whatever it proclaims. Now, if you notice, the, 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 it's important to take note, the word spirits in that verse is a small s, not a capital S. It's not talking about trying the spirits of God, the celestial beings of God. It's talking about the spirit of, you know, somebody can talk to you and there is a spirit of conversation that's going on there. You get that? There's a spirit within a person that drives a person to do what they do. The Bible says to try those spirits and to see if they're of God. Because there's many spirits that go out and they're false prophets. So Satan, he's a manipulator, right? Satan is one that goes out and he masquerades as the angel of, of light, right? So how much more do you think that Satan's going to do that using people to masquerade? They sound good, it sounds right, but the Bible says not to believe every spirit. Just because it claims something doesn't mean that you should just believe it. The Bible says try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Now, here's what I don't want you to miss, because it says that every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. Now, what What does that mean? Hey, I've heard people that I believe it are false prophets that have claimed that Jesus has come in the flesh. They say that with their lips. So what is that talking about? I think it goes much deeper than just a conversation. I believe it has to do with the way they live. Okay? Let me just say this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he came in order, he was manifest in order that he could snuff out the work of Satan, right? What is the work of Satan? To make everything about everything else except about God, right? God should be on the throne. Satan doesn't care what's on the throne, if it's you or if it's him or if it's your possessions. or He doesn't care what it is as long as it's not God. That's the work of the devil. But Jesus came in order that he could eliminate the work of the devil. Does that make sense? You with me? You tracking with me? If I'm going to try the spirits, I'm going to find out whether or not a person who claims with their lips, they are what they say they are, that they're living what they say they have. And it's going to be evident who's on the throne of their life. If you look close enough. We ought to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Because that which is of God, we need to listen and believe. But those that are not of God, the Bible says not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits. Why? Because there's a spirit of truth and there is a spirit of error. 
You better understand that. So I fair warn you, be careful when you get onto the Christian radio or Christian TV that you're just soaking in whatever comes your way. And by the way, how are you going to try the spirits on that? All you're going to see is what, what they put in front of you to see. So it's really hard, right? You got to be careful. Just because it claims things that are religious doesn't make it right. You got to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. I believe that's why it's so important you understand the local church and the local ministry that God has in your city that you connect to. Because in that, you're able then to try the spirit and to see whether it's genuine or not. If there's a message that I try to preach more than anything in this church, and I may not necessarily preach it behind this pulpit as much as I try to preach it in my conversations with every one of you, is that God wants us to be real. He wants us to be real in everything that we're doing in our life. And I've had some people say, oh, pastor, if you really knew me, I don't think you'd like me. I, I tell them, no. I, you know what? It's not a matter of what I like or don't like. It's a matter that you just need to be yourself and be real. Because in being real, then we can get real with God. As long as we're masquerading, playing a game, and putting on a costume, and, and making sure everybody sees what we think they want to see, we'll never have a real relationship with Jesus. We're too busy playing a game. God wants us to be real. So we find the Scripture says to try every spirit, whether they be of God. And then, not only are we to try spirit, but look at verse number 7. And it goes on to say, beloved, let us what? Love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not doesn't know God. He knows not God. For God is love. Verse number 9, in this was manifested. Okay, we got a little theme word running here. You notice verse number, uh, verse number 5 in chapter 3, verse number 8, and now here in verse number 9 of chapter 4, that word manifested. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live what? Through Him. Not through ourself, but through Him. I can't get off of verse 8. He that loves not knows not God. So do you love? Sure I love, Pastor. I mean, I do things for people all the time. Of course I love. All right, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians, we've been studying that on Sunday night. says... Though I give my body to be burned for somebody else and have not love. So just because you do for other people don't mean you love. Faith is important because without faith it's impossible to please God. You've got to have faith. But now, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now abideth faith, hope, Love. These three. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Did you know you can have faith without love? Did you know that you can have a hope without love? But you can't have love without faith and hope. It kind of comes in a package deal. Guess what the first thing is in the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Joy and peace. Long-suffering. Jonah's going to temperance. Faith, meekness, I got them a little bit mixed up there. But anyway, they're there. Against such there is no law. We are to abide in him, and in him is no sin. When we abide in him, we know love. When we know love, we're going to love. And if you don't have love, my friend, I just want to tell you, according to God's word, you don't have God. You can't have God and not have love. All right, so what is love? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Verse number 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He came to be the substitute for us. So what does that look like? Well, I've got to take you back to Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were dirty scoundrels, jerks. You fill in the blank. He laid his life down for you. That's love. Oh, I love as long as they do this or do that, or they don't do this or they don't do that. You aren't loving if you got any kind of stipulations on it. Period. Don't tell me you have God and you don't love. Because if you don't love, you don't have God. Because God is love. And we are to be those that are consumed with Christ and Him on the throne of our life. And when He's on the throne of our life, then His love is going to emanate through us and we're going to love others. With no strings attached. So Jesus, he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. He was beaten. He was smitten for us. His his beard plucked out by the roots. The cat of nine tails was lashed across his back with shard metal and bones that were weaved into the whip that when it hit the flesh, it would literally jam and stick into the flesh and they would have to rip it loose. 39 times with a cat of nine tails. Nine times 39 is what? Mathematician in the building. Nine times 39 is what? Okay, somebody pull out your phone. Do your math since you can't do it in your head. 351 lashes. Can you imagine with a single strand? 351 times. Take nine strands, every lash is nine lashes with shard metal and bones sticking in the flesh of Christ and being ripped apart. And then we wonder how in the world Jesus could hang on the cross and there on that cross they say he didn't even have the image of a man. Now you can understand why. They pierced a crown of thorns into his head. I don't know about you, but somewhere along that line, I would have really, my faith would have been tested really hard, right? So I've had people hurt my feelings, and it'd be tested. You been there? Anybody? There's a few of you are honest with me. But yet Jesus, as he hung on that cross, what did he say in his love? Father, forgive them. The very ones who hung him on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that we ought not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think on the things of others. The last part of the message last week was all about how that we ought to pray for those that are in need and that it ought not to be about ourselves. And the scripture says that herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and that his son came to be that propitiation, that substitute for our sins. So what kind of a substitute are you being for those who you're supposed to love? Or are you too consumed with yourself and what you want? What makes you happy? What pleases you? Because that's not Christ's likeness. That's sin. You're not abiding in Christ if that's where you're at. When we abide in Christ, there is no sin in Christ. And when we abide in him, we find a peace and a fellowship with him. So it goes on to say in verse number 11 there, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to do what? To love one another. If Christ 
loved us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then while people are still mean and hateful and nasty and cruel to us, we ought to still love others. <laughs> but you can't do it if you ain't saved. Just telling you. You can try all you want to, but if you're not a Christian, you can't do it. You've only been playing a game, you can't do it. Because it only comes from one place, and that's from Christ alone. And he has to be abiding in you before you're able to, to do such a thing as this. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, if we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected or completed in us. Once again, whosoever shall confess... Live out that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in him and he in God. In other words, if I confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to take away the sins of the world, and I've received that in my life, and yet I'm not allowing that same love that he had for me of dying on the cross while I was yet a sinner. I'm not conveying that same love to those who are cruel and mean and jerks and everything else. Then can I truly say that I know him who is love? I can confess it, but do I really confess it? Is it real? Is it genuine? It's through the outpouring of our life that others see the genuineness of our Christian life. It goes on to say in verse number 16, and, and we know, and, and we have known and believe the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells, again, where Christ is, sin doesn't dwell. He that dwells, it says, in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, complete, mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, we are, we so, excuse me, as he is, so are we in this world. Verse number 18, before we hit into that, I just want you to see this. Understanding truth and error, you have to try the Spirit. Second, you have to understand what your motivation is. Understand your motivation. So what's your motivation? What motivates you? What's the end game for you? What's the destination? How many of you got a GPS or something that navigates for you in the car, huh? Besides your wife, okay? All right. And maybe she joins in, I don't know. Or your husband. Maybe you drive and your husband sits over there. And... But if you have a navigational system, guess what? That navigational system will never get you where you're going until you put in the destination. Just won't. Isn't it absolutely amazing that we live our Christian life and we never put in the destination and we hope that we're doing everything we ought to be doing and what pleases God. How about you put the destination in first and then everything between here and there starts making sense. Put in the destination. What is the destination? Jesus said what it was. Two things. Love God and love others. And in these two things lie all the law and the prophets. All the laws that were written, 613 laws, and everything any prophet ever said or ever will say is boiled down in these two things, love God and love others. That's the destination. When, I, when my heart is set on loving God, I'm going to treat my wife the way I should treat her. I'm going to treat my kids the way I should treat them. I'm going to, I'm going to have an, the mind about my job that I should have about my job because my destination is to love God. And by the way, what's coupled beside a loving God is loving others. They go hand in hand. They go together. So, let's continue on. In verse number 18, it says, There is no fear in love. What does that mean? I've, I've been a... I just want you to understand this. That when your motivation, when your motivation is love, you don't have anything to fear. 
But what if somebody thinks this about what I'm doing? Who cares what they think? When you know that your heart is pure and you know that you're motivated by love and it's genuine, you're not going to be afraid to move forward, even where everybody else might be. Do you know fear paralyzes? And you know there's a lot of people who stand back who play Dr. Kevorkian in a sense with a little syringe in their pocket and they love to go around people and go, ha, fear. Ha, fear. And they love to fear people because they can, they can put them in a state of not doing anything. Fear paralyzes. They paralyze people. Listen. All I can say is this as a church, God wants us to storm the gates of hell. And anything that wants to paralyze that, I don't know about you, but that is not love. God motivates us to move forward, to do what pleases Him, and we ought to, with the purest of heart, want to love God and love others, and anything else doesn't matter. We're going to stay focused on that. Because that's the end destination. Everything between here and there will begin to make sense. Because that's the end destination. You see? Two people can do the same thing. One can be right and one can be wrong. What is it that makes one right and makes one wrong? Their motivating factor, right? Why are they doing it? That's it. What motivates them? So try the Spirit. See whether they be of God. That which is pure will rise to the surface. It'll be seen. It'll be known. Try the Spirit. See whether they be of God. But where love is, there's no fear. But perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. And he that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Verse number 20 says, If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. And the truth is not in him. He's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he he love God whom he hath not seen? Now get this. Don't miss this. This is the last verse of this chapter. And this commandment, what commandment? This commandment, what commandment? This commandment. That entails all the law and the prophets is right here. This commandment. Have we of him that he who loves God... Loves his brother also. So how am I to love God? With every ounce of all that I am. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is just as important to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. Isn't that amazing how just like it's graffitied all over Scripture, everywhere? How could we miss it? Our end destination should be to love God and to love others. And then all of a sudden, everything else begins to make sense. Why should you care about your family? Why should you care about your job? Why should you care about those you don't even know? Why? Because you want to love God and you want to love others. You want others to love God too. So when you love God and love others, you're going to make a difference. Every head bowed and every eye closed.